Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're talking here about movies and uh, movies based on books. And uh, a couple of people were noting that the on the cover of the edition that they have of Mrs. Dalloway, it says, this is the book that inspired the movie The Hours. <laughs> well, also there's a movie, Mrs. Dalloway, which uh, is really a very good movie. It's also a very good uh, uh, representation of the novel. It's very faithful to the novel. You know, no, no film is going to be exactly the same as the novel. And of course, our experience is going to be very different, isn't it? Um, when you're reading a book, it's really taking place in your mind and in your imagination, isn't it? And when you're seeing something on a screen, another person has come along, a director along with the other creative people, has come along and made a series of choices about how things will look, how things will sound, how things will be enacted. So that this doesn't mean that you no longer have free play of imagination, but notice that your imagination now is more restricted to what is on the screen, isn't it? Um, <clears throat> none of you are old enough for this, but I can remember um, when, well, no, you probably aren't, though, because I'm, I'm talking about being a kid in the 1950s. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, seeing, seeing television shows that were based on movies, excuse me, on, on uh, radio shows. People always had listened to the radio, you know, and they would have all kinds of shows, quiz shows, and so forth. But they also had uh, narratives on the radio, on the old radio. Some of them were serial narratives. Yeah, things like The Shadow and so forth, yeah. And uh, then, in the early days of television, they simply took over those radio shows and tried to televise them. Well, the problem was that they were very disappointing in most cases. Because in your mind, you already had made up what people looked like, what their houses looked like, all of that sort of thing. But now somebody was making you see that image from their point of view as they made it up. Uh, so, you know, the Lone Ranger just didn't look right. He wasn't, you know, as neat looking as he was in my own mind's eye. Well, the same thing is true with, with any film which is based on a book. On the other hand, having said that, let me also say that the film version, Mrs. Dalloway, is a very, very good representation of the novel. And I, I highly recommend it. It came out just a few years ago. I forget now how many, but, you know, within the last few years. Okay, I'm flipping ahead now. And since we're dealing with uh, different editions which have different pagination, unfortunately, I can't give you a precise page number. But I'm flipping ahead. They're still now in the street or along the street of London in the early part of the novel. And there's a violent explosion which makes Mrs. Dalloway jump. And Miss Pym, who's running the shop that Mrs. Dalloway has gone into now, go to the window and apologize and says that this came from a motor car. This is a backfire. This is a backfire. Now, in a city in the 1920s, people obviously would have seen cars before, but still, you know, it would have been unfamiliar enough that when there was a loud backfire, you'd jump, you know, because you weren't expecting that kind of a sound. And so she jumps as if it were a gun being fired. Well, of course it isn't. A motor car which is drawn to the side of the pavement precisely opposite Mulberry shop window. Notice all the references to places here. Passersby who, of course, stopped and stared had just time to see a face of the very greatest importance against the dove gray upholstery before a male hand drew the blind and there was nothing to be seen except a square of dove gray. 
This is a limousine, okay, an old-fashioned limousine. Yet rumors were at once in circulation from the middle of Bond Street to Oxford Street on one side to Atkinson's scent shop on the other, passing invisibly, inaudibly, like a cloud, swift, veil-like, upon hills, falling indeed with something of a cloud sudden sobriety and stillness upon the faces, which a second before had been utterly disorderly. But now mystery had brushed them with her wing. They had heard the voice of authority. The spirit of religion was abroad with her eyes bandaged tight and her lips gaping wide. But nobody knew whose face had been seen. Was it the Prince of Wales's, the Queen's, the Prime Minister's? Whose face was it? Nobody knew. Edgar J. Watkiss, with his roll of lead piping round his arm, said audibly, humorously, of course, the Prime Minister's car. Septimus Warren Smith, who found himself unable to pass, heard him. This is an interesting way of introducing a character who's going to become not the major character, but a very important character in the novel. Septimus Warren Smith, aged about 30, pale-faced, beak-nosed, wearing brown shoes and a shabby overcoat, with hazel eyes, which had that look of apprehension in them, which makes complete strangers apprehensive too. The world has raised its whip. Where will it descend? Who's doing the speaking here, by the way? That's a very interesting question. I mean, is this simply an authorial voice? Is this somehow or another going inside Septimus's mind and consciousness? Everything had come to a standstill. The throb of the motor engines sounded like a pulse irregularly drumming through an entire body. The sun had become extraordinarily hot because the motor car had stopped outside Mulberry's sharp window. Old ladies on tops of omnibuses spread their black parasols here a green, here a red parasol opened with a little pop. Mrs. Dalloway, coming to the window with her arms full of sweet peas, looked out with her little pink face pursed in inquiry. Everyone looked at the motor car. Septimus looked. Boys on bicycles sprang off. Traffic accumulated. And there the motor car stood with drawn blinds and upon them a curious pattern like a tree. Septimus thought, and his gradual drawing together of everything to one center before his eyes. Okay, see how now we are seeing things no longer through Mrs. Dalloway's eyes, but we've made a shift, so we're now seeing things through Septimus's eyes. But that shift didn't come about all at once, nor is it very easy to see where it began. All right? In this gradual drawing together of everything to one center before his eyes, as if some horror, as if some horror had come almost to the surface and was about to burst into flames, terrified him. The world wavered and quivered and threatened to burst into flames. It is I who am blocking the way, he thought. Was he not being looked at and pointed at? Was he not waited there, rooted to the pavement for a purpose? But for what purpose? I mean, this guy does not occupy the world that most of us occupy, right? So we're already beginning to get some intimations of how disturbed he truly is. Let us go on, Septimus, said his wife, a little woman with large eyes in a sallow, pointed face, an Italian girl. But Lucrezia herself could not help looking at the motor car and the tree pattern on the blinds. Was it the queen in there? The queen going shopping? And so forth. Uh, well, okay. Uh, a little bit further along, She's noticing that people are noticing Septimus, or at least she's thinking that he is. 
Um, people must notice. People must see. People, she thought, looking at the crowd, staring at the motor car, the English people with their children and their horses and their clothes, which she admired in a way, but they were people now because Septimus had said, I will kill myself. An awful thing to say. Suppose they had heard him. She looked at the crowd. Help, help, she wanted to cry out to butchers, boys, and women. Help, only last autumn, she and Septimus had stood on the embankment, wrapped in the same cloak, and Septimus reading a paper instead of talking. She had snatched it from him and laughed in the old man's face who saw them. But failure one conceals. She must take him away into some park, and so forth. Well, okay. Uh, we find out, by the way, that she's only uh, 24 years old. She was called a girl a moment ago. She's not quite a girl, but nevertheless. Um, so then we hear more about the speculation. Is it the Queen? Is it the Prince of Wales? The Prime Minister and so forth. And these people having parties and perhaps they're going to Buckingham Palace. And it turns out that Clarissa herself is going to give a party. And the whole rest of the novel now is going to be about Clarissa getting ready for her party and the different people whom she meets along the way or doesn't meet along the way, because she never actually meets Septimus and Rhesia. But rumor is flying here and there along the, uh, the, the street about the car. And then notice that that is replaced by an airplane which is making letters in the sky. You've seen this, haven't you, where you know, an airplane will be up and it'll be, usually be an advertisement for something. And uh, so we have people trying to figure out what the letters are because the wind is apparently blowing so that the, uh, that the letters are losing their contours too quickly for people to make out individual letters and certainly the whole word. So uh, some at any rate are thinking that it's, it's toffee. It's toffee that, uh, that, that they're advertising. A nursemaid told Risha. To the, together they began to spell T-O-F-K-R, said the nursemaid, and Septimus heard her say K-R close to his ear. Deeply, softly, like a mellow organ, but with a roughness in her voice like a grasshopper's, which rasped his spine deliciously and sent running up into his brain waves of sound which, concussing, broke. A marvelous discovery indeed, that the human voice in certain atmospheric conditions, for one must be scientific, above all scientific, can quicken trees into life. Who's speaking there? It's an interesting question. Is that Septimus inside his own mind? Well, hard to tell. Happily, Rizia put her hand with a tremendous weight on his knee so that he was weighted down, transfixed, or the excitement of the elm trees rising and falling rising and falling with all their leaves alight, and the color thinning and thickening from blue to the green of a hollow wave, the plumes on horses' heads, feathers on ladies. So proudly they rose and fell, so superbly would have sent him mad. But he would not go mad. He would shut his eyes. He would see no more. Now notice there's a kind of double voicing here, isn't there? I mean, in one sense, it's an authorial voice, which is telling us what he is thinking. But in another sense, we are hearing, as it were, what's going on inside his mind. But they beckoned. Leaves were alive. Trees were alive. And the leaves being connected by millions of fibers with his own body, there on the seat, fanned it up and down. When the branch stretched, he too made that statement. 
the sparrows fluttering, rising and falling in jagged fountains were part of the pattern. The white and the blue, barred with black branches, sounds made harmonies with premeditation. The spaces between them were as significant as the sounds. A child cried. Rightly, far away, a horn sounded. All taken together meant the birth of a new religion. Good grief, you know, what is going on with this fellow? Septimus, said Regia. He started violently. People must notice. I'm going to walk to the fountain and back, she said, for she could stand it no longer. Dr. Holmes might say there was nothing the matter. Far rather would she that he were dead. Well, that's pretty strong. She's talking about her husband, right? Dr. Holmes says nothing really is the matter with him. Dr. Holmes is the first of the two doctors we're going to meet. And uh, Dr. Holmes is going to say things like, oh, don't worry about it. You just need to take up a hobby, take up some activity. Why, when I feel a little bit out of sorts, I uh, take a day off, spend some time with my wife, and go play golf. Well, come on. You know, I mean, we're talking about somebody who is very, very seriously psychologically disturbed. But Dr. Holmes believes, as many people believed, it's simply a matter of exercising willpower to control yourself. You can do it if you want to. Okay. Um, and so she could not sit beside him when he stared so and did not see her and made everything terrible. See, this is her reaction. She wishes rather that her husband were dead than that he was doing what he's doing now. Sky and tree, children playing, dragging carts, blowing whistles, falling down, all were terrible. And he would not kill himself, and she could tell no one. Septimus has been working too hard. That was all she could say to her own mother. And then notice, to love makes one solitary, she thought. To love makes one solitary, she thought. Okay? See, this is exactly the opposite of what we conventionally think about love, right? She could tell nobody, not even Septimus now. And looking back, she saw him sitting in his shabby overcoat alone on the seat, hunched up, staring. And it was cowardly for a man to say he would kill himself. But Septimus had fought. He was brave. He was not Septimus now. Well, okay. So this goes on, by the way, um, how, you know, Septimus has been thinking about how he could kill himself, and then she worries about that because he obviously has passed some of that on to her. Uh, there are birds opposite, opposite Septimus uh, chirping away, and Septimus uh, four or five times over and went on, drawing its notes out to sing freshly and piercingly in Greek words how there is no crime, and joined by another sparrow, they sang in voices prolonged and piercing in Greek words from trees in the meadow of life, beyond the river where the dead walk, how there is no death. Well, notice the, even the birds now are speaking Greek to him, or singing Greek to him. There was his hand. There the dead. While things were assembling behind the railings opposite, but he dared not look. Evans was behind the railings. Evans is going to turn up, by the way, to be the guy he was in the army with, who was blown up before his eyes. Well, okay. So, we move along with this, and then we come back to 
Clarissa, back to Mrs. Dalloway. And I'm moving on to the next section. These sections, notice, are marked not by changes in chapters, but simply by white space, right? There will be a blank white space. What are they looking at, said Clarissa Dalloway to the maid who opened her door. OK. And presumably, people have been looking up at the letters in the sky. Because that is one of those things that has been recurring from time to time. Notice how Wolf does that. She'll be going along in the narrative, and there will be something that will occur. It can be the car passing, you know, the limousine with somebody important in it. Or it can be the letters in the sky, or something like that. And she will go on with a certain stretch in the narrative in which somebody will look at the letters in the sky and then will go off into some reverie of their own. Then we'll return to whatever the, the point is, the point of reference is. Once again, say the letters in the sky. And then we're off again. And then we're brought back to the present reality by yet another reference to the letters in the sky. And then later on in the novel, she'll pick up something else instead of that, such as the sounding of Big Ben. What are they looking at, said Clarissa Dalloway to the maid who opened her door. The hall of the house was cool as a vault. Mrs. Dalloway raised her hand to her eyes. And as the maid shut the door to, she heard the swish of Lucy's skirts. OK, so if you were not clear on this before, you now know that Lucy is her maid. She felt like a nun who has left the world and feels fold round her the familiar veils and the response to old devotions. The cook whistled in the kitchen. She heard the click of the typewriter. It was her life, and bending her head over the hall table, she bowed beneath the influence felt blessed and purified, saying to herself as she took the pad with the telephone message on it, how moments like this are buds on the tree of life. This is what she's saying to herself, right? Moments like this are buds, are, are like uh, buds on the tree of life. Flowers of darkness they are, she thought as if some lovely rose had blossomed for her eyes only. Not for a moment did she believe in God. This is something else that's going to come up at different points. Uh, religion, who believes in God, who doesn't believe, who has converted or been drawn to some kind of religion or religious belief, who has not. Um, Clarissa is a self-styled atheist. Not for a moment did she believe in God, but all the more, she thought, taking up the pad, one must repay in daily life to servants, yes, to dogs and canaries. Above all, to Richard, her husband, who was the foundation of it, of the gay sounds, of the green lights, of the cook even whistling, for Mrs. Walker was Irish and whistled all day long. One must pay back from this secret deposit of exquisite moments, she thought, lifting the pad, while Lucy stood by her, trying to explain how. Well, OK. Now, notice we're getting a number of things here. Class. Obviously, these people are of a certain class, aren't they? I mean, they've got a very, very nice house, which is very elegantly appointed. They uh, obviously are people of some means. That doesn't mean that they're you know, wildly wealthy, but they are people of considerable means. Her husband obviously has an important position so that uh, he's bringing in a substantial income. And uh, they have servants. They don't have a whole flock of servants, but they do have servants. And obviously, once again, not just anybody could afford to have servants like this. And we find out later, when we are at her party, that she has all of these people coming who are titled aristocrats, 
lord this and sir that and lady such and such. And even the prime minister shows up at her party. So uh, obviously uh, the Dalloways are at least within their own circle people to be reckoned with. Well, okay. Well, then we go back in memory. And she's back to the, uh, the place where they all used to, uh, to go on their vacations. And then she talks about Sally. Um, she talks about how she would read late at night of the retreat from Moscow. She and her uh, husband apparently no longer are occupying the same bedroom, to say anything of the same bed, but they're sleeping in a different bedroom now. And she is reading late at night of the retreat from Moscow, presumably Napoleon's retreat from Moscow, for the house, that is to say the, the house of, of uh, commons, for the house sat so long that Richard insisted after her illness that she must sleep undisturbed. And really she preferred to read of the retreat from Moscow. He knew it, okay, rather than for the two of them to sleep together. So the room was an attic, the bed narrow and lying there reading, for she slept badly. She could not dispel a virginity preserved through childbirth which clung to her like a sheet. Lovely in girlhood, suddenly there came a moment, for example, on the river beneath the woods at Clevedon, when through some contraction of this cold spirit, she had failed him. And then at Constantinople, and again, and again, she could see what she lacked. It was not beauty, it was not mind. It was something central which permeated, something warm which broke up surfaces and rippled the cold contact of man and woman, or of women together. For that she could dimly perceive. She resented it, had a scruple picked up heaven knows where, or as she felt sent by nature, who is invariably wise. Yet she could not resist sometimes yielding to the charm of a woman, not a girl, of a woman confessing as to her they often did some scrape, some folly. And whether it was pity or their beauty or that she was older or some accident, like a faint scent or a violin next door, so strange is the power of sounds at certain moments, she did undoubtedly then feel what men felt and she's talking about sexual attraction towards another woman. Only for a moment, but it was enough. It was a sudden revelation, a tinge like a blush, which one tried to check and then as it spread, one yielded to its expansion and rushed to the farthest verge and there quivered and felt the world come closer, swollen with some astonishing significance, some pressure of rapture, which split its thin skin and gushed and poured with an extraordinary alleviation over cracks and sores. Then for that moment, she had seen an illumination, a match burning in a crocus, an inner meaning almost expressed. But the clothes withdrew, the heart softened. It was over, the moment, and so forth. So, uh, and then she hears the click of the door and it's Richard downstairs trying to be quiet so as not to disturb her. But this question of love, she thought, putting her coat away, this falling in love with women. Take Sally Seton, her relation in the old days with Sally Seton. Had that not, after all, been love? And so then she goes on to talk about that and how naive and ignorant she was. Uh, she then talks about how Sally, and it wasn't that Sally had forgotten a towel, as I said before our, 
our break, but it's to tell you had forgotten her, her sponge for bath and ran naked down the, uh, the hall to, uh, to get that. And the grim old housemaid, Ellen Atkins, went about grumbling, suppose any of the gentlemen had seen. Indeed, she did shock people. She was untidy, Papa said. And this, of course, gives us some insight into Sally, not only through the eyes of Clarissa, but also Sally as she would have appeared perhaps to anybody. Later on, we hear how she appeared to Peter Walsh, for example. And she was always kind of rebellious and, and independent and, uh, you know, went against conventions. So, uh, this goes on, by the way. This talk about the, the quality of the feeling that she could have for another woman uh, and how marriage was in one sense a catastrophe. And it's a complicated matter because she, in her own way, she loves Richard, her husband, but at the same time, marriage has turned out, turned out to be a disappointment for her. And therefore, sometimes in her exaggerated way, she'll talk about it as a catastrophe. It's obviously not truly a catastrophe. He's not abusing her. He's not neglecting her. I mean, he's not a bad husband. Uh, he's not a bad man in any, in any uh, way. Uh, he may be a little dull, if we take the point of view of Peter Walsh. Uh, he may be a little too stiff and straight-laced and conventional in certain respects, but so is Clarissa, his wife. I mean, she's very straight-laced and conventional, too, in her own way. Okay, uh, so this, however, does go on. And finally, there's the one evening when they're out together and there's a group of people. Sally and she get separated. Sally stopped, picked a flower, kissed her on the lips. The whole world might have turned upside down, and so forth. Okay, so I don't want to make more of this than Wolf does, but it is a sufficiently important part of the novel that she spends quite a number of pages talking about her memory of this relationship and contrasting that with her memory of her relationship with Richard, her husband. So that therefore gives it a certain importance in the novel that we can ask questions about. What is the function of that? OK, so then we move on. And we have Mrs. Dalloway and Peter Walsh a little bit further along. And all of a sudden, at the door. Here's Peter Walsh, and he's back from India. Notice we have various references to India, not only to his having been in India for the last five years, but also to other parts of the British Isles, Bombay. Well, you know, other parts of the British Isles, Bombay, but also other parts of the British Isles out there in the east. And uh, so the, the point I'm getting at here is look at the British attitude toward India and toward the peoples of what were then the British colonies. And you can see the kind of colonialism that we have been talking about before as most particularly when we were looking at uh, Conrad's Heart of Darkness but also going all the way back to William Blake's poem, The Little Black Boy, right? So here we have the attitudes towards people who, who have gone out to India, what India means to them, what the Indians of India mean to them, and so forth. And to a large extent, the British upper classes are very, very condescending toward the Indians 
as those colonial peoples. Okay? So, that's not altogether true of Peter Walsh, by the way, who uh, uh, often is poking fun, if not openly, at least in his own mind, at what he thinks are some of the pretensions and the affectations and the condescensions of the British. Okay? Um, but here he is. Here's Peter Walsh. And how are you, said Peter Walsh, positively trembling, taking both her hands, kissing both her hands. Okay? He's still in love with her, by the way. I mean, it's not that, you know, if one met a very good friend, you know, I mean, a man met a very good woman friend, uh, there would be anything out of line for taking her hand and maybe even kissing her hand if you were really very close friends in the past. Uh, but notice for him, this is a very intense experience. She's grown older, he thought, sitting down. I shan't tell her anything about it, he thought, for she's grown older. She's looking at me, he thought, a sudden embarrassment coming over him, though he had kissed her hands. Putting his hand into his pocket, he took out a large pocket knife and half opened the blade. And this is a kind of nervous gesture that he does throughout the novel, right? And as I said earlier, other people notice this and even remark on the fact that when he's feeling nervous or feeling anxious, he'll pull out his pocket knife. Exactly the same, thought Clarissa. The same queer look. The same check suit. A little out of the straight his face is. A little thinner. Drier, perhaps. But he looks awfully well and just the same. How heavenly it is to see you again, she exclaimed. He had his knife out. That's so like him, she thought. He had only reached town last night, he said. Would have to go down into the country at once. And how was everything? How was everybody? Richard, Elizabeth, Elizabeth is her daughter. And what's all this, he said, tilting his penknife toward her green dress. He's very well dressed, thought Clarissa. Yet he always criticizes me. Here she is mending her dress. Mending her dress as usual, he thought. See how we're going back and forth? He thought this about her. She thought that about him and so forth. They haven't seen one another in years. Here she's been sitting all the time I've been in India. Mending her dress. Playing about. Going to parties. Running to the house and back and all that, he thought, growing more and more irritated, more and more agitated, for there's nothing in the world so bad for some women as marriage, he thought, and politics, and having a conservative husband like the admirable Richard. So it is, so it is, he thought, shutting his knife with a snap. Conservative with a capital C, because this is the conservative party, not just somebody who is conservative uh, in, in personality, like the admirable Richard. Richard's very well. Richard's at a committee. Richard's often at a committee. He's off at the house. Notice that's always the house with a capital H, because we're talking about a house of parliament. And she opened her scissors and said, did he mind her just finishing what she was doing to her dress, for they had a party that night, which I shan't ask you to, she said, my dear Peter. But it was delicious to hear her say that. My dear Peter, indeed it was all so delicious. The silver, the chairs, all so delicious. Why wouldn't she ask him to her party, he asked. Well, notice that they're going to carry on this conversation with one another, which is a, a polite, superficial conversation up to a point in which both of them are really thrilled with just having seen one another, right? And just being together there, at least for the moment. 
And of course, her party. And she's preoccupied with the party. But she says, teasing him, but you're not invited. But of course, that's, in a way, a way of saying, you are invited. Because she is just teasing. And at the end of this encounter, by the way, she's going to shout after him, but don't forget my party. Don't forget my party. Now, of course, thought Clarissa, he's enchanting, perfectly enchanting. Now I remember how impossible it was ever to make up my mind. And why did I make up my mind not to marry him? She wondered that awful summer. And of course, we get that whole business. We're going to have another flashback, by the way, to that summer when Richard Dalloway showed up at the place where they were all having their vacation. And she had been carried, carrying on this relationship with, uh, with Peter, apparently for a long time. And they had a kind of meeting of the minds such that there's even a description at one point that their minds just sort of flowed into one another's. And uh, they were, as the common expression is, sort of soulmates, right? So why didn't she marry him? She wonders. And of course, we might wonder too. Why didn't she marry him? You know, why did she marry Richard instead? Look, look at the missed opportunity for both of them. Well, um, you know, that, that awful summer. Well, okay. So we move on. And she's looking at him. They're talking with one another. Stop, stop. It's, it's, something's coming up to the surface. Uh, and, and he can't stand it, the, you know, being there with her and the, the looks that she's giving him and so forth. Stop, stop. He wanted to cry. He was not old. His life was not over, not by any means. He was only just past 50. We find out a little bit later on he's 53. Shall I tell her, he thought, or not? He would like to make a clean breast of it all, but she is too cold, he thought, sewing with her sisters. Daisy would look ordinary beside Clarissa. Daisy, it turns out, is who? Do you know? Yes, it's the woman that he plans to marry. Uh, would look ordinary beside Clarissa. And she would think me a failure, which I am in their sense, he thought. In the Dalloway's sense, I am a failure. Now, that's confirmed later on at Lady uh, uh, Bruton's when uh, Hugh Whitbread and uh, Richard Dalloway are having lunch with her and talking about how she wants them to help her draft a letter to the Times over one of her causes. And they get talking about Peter Walsh. And couldn't we or shouldn't we do something for poor Peter Walsh? And they really do regard him as something of a failure. Not a total failure. I mean, he's not down and out, of course. But somebody who has never really achieved the potential he one time seemed to have. So, I am a failure in their sense, he thought, in the Dalloway sense. Oh, yes, he had no doubt about that. He was a failure. Compared with all this, the inlaid table, the mounted paper knife, the dolphin and the candlesticks, the chair covers, and the old, valuable English tinted prints. He was a failure. See, all of these things around him in this beautiful house with the beautiful furnishings are crying out to him as witnesses to his failure. I detest the smugness of the whole affair, he thought. Richard's doing, not Clarissa's save that she married him. Here Lucy came into the room carrying silver, more silver, but charming, slender, graceful, she looked, he thought, as she stooped to put it down. And this has been going on all the time, he thought. Week after week, Clarissa's life, while I, he thought, and at once everything seemed to radiate from him 
journeys, rides, quarrels, adventures, bridge parties, love affairs, work, work, work. And he took out his knife quite openly, his old horn-handled knife, which Clarissa could swear he had had these 30 years and clenched his fist upon it. Well, so this goes on until finally he says to her, I'm in love. I'm in love. In love, he repeated, now speaking rather dryly to Clarissa Dalloway. In love with a girl in India, he had deposited his garland. Clarissa could make what she would of it. In love, she said, that he at his age should be sucked under in his little bow tie by that monster, the monster being love. And there's no flesh on his neck. His hands are red and he's six months older than I am. Her eye flashed back to her, but in her heart she felt all the same. He is in love. He has that, she felt. He is in love. Well, okay. Then just a little bit farther along, he says, after she asks, and who is he? Well, a married woman, unfortunately, he said, the wife of a major in the Indian army. The wife of a major, well, he can get himself into big time trouble here. Um, and with a curious, ironical sweetness, he smiled as he placed her in this ridiculous way before Clarissa. All the same, he is in love, thought Clarissa. She has, he continued very reasonably, two small children, a boy and a girl, and I've come over to see my lawyers about the divorce. There they are, he thought. Do what you like with them, Clarissa. There they are. And second by second, it seemed to him that the wife of the major in the Indian army, his daisy, and her two small children became more and more lovely as Clarissa looked at them, and so on. Uh, Clarissa now is trying to fashion in her own mind what she thinks they look like. Well, he must be in love. Her old friend, her dear Peter, he was in love. Well, what does he do? He, you know, at his age, I mean, it's not as if he's, you know, <laughs> old, 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 okay? Uh, that's right. Um, but at his age, you know, and he's falling in love like a schoolboy. Well, okay. I know all that, Peter thought. I know what I'm up against, he thought, running his finger along the blade of his knife. Clarissa and Dalloway and all the rest of them, but I'll show Clarissa. And then to his utter surprise, suddenly thrown by those uncontrollable forces, thrown through the air, he burst into tears, wept, wept without the least shame, sitting on the sofa, the tears running down his cheeks. And Clarissa had leaned forward, taken his hand, drawn him to her, kissed him, actually had felt his face on hers before she could down the brandishing of silver flashing plumes like pompous grass in a tropic gale in her breast, which subsiding, left her holding his hand, patting his knee, and feeling as she sat back extraordinarily at her ease with him. And lighthearted, all in a clap it came over her. If I had married him, this gaiety would have been mine all day. It was all over for her. The sheet was stretched and the bed narrow. She had gone up into the tower alone and left them black burying in the sun. The door had shut. And there among the dust of fallen plaster and the litter of birds' nests, how distant the view had looked. And the sounds came thin and chill. Once on Leith Hill, she remembered, and Richard 
Richard, and so forth. Okay, so we're going to have once again the striking of Big Ben on the half hour, he leaving and she crying, Peter, Peter, following him out onto the landing of the stairway. My party tonight, remember, my party tonight, she cried, having to raise her voice against the roar of the open air, and overwhelmed by the traffic and the sound of all the clocks striking, her voice crying, remember my party tonight, sounded frail and thin and very far away as Peter Walsh shut the door. And then we have Big Bend again. Well, okay. So that's a very important section because we've learned a great deal about the two of them and how much each one means to the other and how each one is so preoccupied with the other. She thinks a lot about him, doesn't she? And he obviously thinks a great deal about her. And much of the novel, of course, is taken up with one or the other of them going off into these reveries of remembrance. Well, OK. Um, we have a long period of him going out to the park now and dreaming. And he wakes up. There's the nurse there, by the way, uh, who doesn't bother him. And so he's dreaming. We know that he's asleep because he's snoring. And um, then he wakes up with a start, but he continues daydreaming. And this goes on for quite a while until we have a transition, another one of our transitions, to Septimus. And then we have Septimus, uh, and we have Evans being killed. He sees and hears Evans out there sitting on the park bench, and he thinks he sees Evans coming around a corner and so forth. Uh, and he talks about how he can no longer feel, he can no longer feel anything. Um, going to flip over here. And we keep flipping back and forth, by the way. Uh, between Septimus, and then we're back to uh, to uh, uh, Peter Walsh. Uh, Peter Walsh goes on and on and on in his own head, by the way, with a kind of social criticism. The shallowness of Hugh Whitbread, uh, of Richard Dalloway, and even of Clarissa, whom he characterizes simply as a perfect hostess. And he means that sarcastically. A perfect hostess. You see, someone whose life extends no farther than being a gracious hostess, that she doesn't really think, and she doesn't talk about serious things, but she is a good hostess. Well, I'm now flipping over to Septimus again. And this is almost halfway, not quite halfway, but almost halfway through the novel. Septimus was one of the first to volunteer. He went to France to save an England which consisted almost entirely of Shakespeare's plays and Miss Isabel Pohl in a green dress walking in a square. And one of the things that we learn is that Septimus uh, as a young man, had encountered Miss Isabel Pohl, who lectured him on Shakespeare's plays, and particularly on Antony and Cleopatra. You're frowning. Oh, 
No, you're not frowning. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. I thought I thought maybe you know some great thought was coming that we we that we should know about. Okay. Uh, there in the trenches, the change which Mr. Brewer, that's his employer back home, desired when he advised football was produced instantly. He developed manliness. He was promoted. He drew the attention, indeed the affection, of his officer, Evans by name. It was a case of two dogs playing on a hearthrug, one worrying a paper screw, snarling, snapping, giving a pinch now and then at the old dog's ear, the other lying somnolent, blinking at the fire, raising a paw, turning and growling good-temperedly. They had to be together, share with each other, fight with each other, quarrel with each other. But when Evans, Rezia had only seen him once, called him a quiet man, a sturdy, red-haired man, undemonstrative in the company of women. When Evans was killed, just before the armistice, which of course is ironic, you know, that's how World War I ended. It didn't win with any decisive victory. It was simply a, a treatise, which was called an armistice at the time, between Germany and France and Britain and so forth. So he was killed just before the armistice, which would have been the cessation of uh, hostilities. In Italy, Septimus, far from showing any emotion or recognizing that here was the end of a friendship, congratulated himself upon feeling very little and very reasonably. The war had taught him. It was sublime. He had gone through the whole show, friendship, European war, death, and one promotion. And still under 30 and was bound to survive. He was right there. The last shells missed him. He watched them explode with indifference. When peace came, he was in Milan, billeted in the house of an innkeeper with a courtyard, flowers in tubs, little tables in the open, daughters making hats. And to Lucrezia, the younger daughter, he became engaged one evening when the panic was on him that he could not feel. So see, at first, when Evans is blown up, ironically, right before the peace comes, he can't feel. I mean, it's like he's numb. He can't have any kind of feeling. Okay? And that's his initial reaction. Now, a few years later, he can feel very, very intensely. Okay? Uh, he feels terror. The world is about to burst into flames. He feels terror at the sight of the dead Evans approaching toward him. Okay? But his initial reaction was to be numb, simply to be numb. Okay, and now it's all over. The war is all over. Well, then we have, um, coming up fairly soon after that, Dr. Holmes. Dr. Holmes. So notice that, you know, he had to be put to bed. Nothing could rouse him. Rizia put him to bed. She sent for a doctor, Mrs. Filmer's Dr. Holmes. Dr. Holmes examined him. There was nothing whatever the matter, said Dr. Holmes. Oh, what a relief. What a kind man. What a good man, thought Rizia. When he felt like that, he went to the music hall, said Dr. Holmes. He took a day off with his wife and played golf. Why not try two tabloids of bromide dissolved in a glass of water at bedtime? These old Bloomsbury houses, said Dr. Holmes, tapping the wall, are often full of very fine paneling, which the landlords have the folly to paper over. 
Only the other day, visiting a patient, Sir Somebody Something in Bedford Square. Good God. You see, this is supposed to be the doctor attending to an obviously very sick man. There was no excuse, nothing whatever the matter, since the sin for which human nature had condemned him to death that he did not feel. He had not cared when Evans was killed. That was worst. But all the other crimes raised their heads and shook their fingers and jeered and sneered over the rail of the bed in the early hours of the morning at the prostrate body which lay realizing its degradation, how he had married his wife without loving her, had lied to her, seduced her, outraged Miss Isabel Pole, and was so pocked and marked with vice that women shuddered when they saw him in the street. The verdict of human nature on such a wretch was death. I mean, all this is taking place in his own head, isn't it? I mean, women are not cringing at the sight of him on the street. But he's projecting this, as we would now say, onto other people. Dr. Holmes came again. Large, fresh, fresh colored, handsome, flicking his boots, looking in the glass. He brushed it all aside, headaches, sleeplessness, fears, dreams. Nerve symptoms and nothing more, he said. Okay. Well, all right. Uh, and then he just goes on with his small talk about what he does if he's a little out of sorts. Well, um, nothing is the matter with him. And of course, this is part of the problem for somebody who is in such serious shape as poor Septimus is, one of the worst possible things is for people to simply brush it off. Oh, it's really nothing. There's really nothing wrong with him or nothing wrong with her. By the way, uh, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but Virginia Woolf herself had very serious bouts of what we would now call clinical depression and uh, became very, very emotionally disturbed herself, particularly after she completed reading a novel, uh, excuse me, writing a novel, uh, which apparently was so taxing for her that, that she would sometimes go into uh, at least a temporary collapse. And so she went to doctors and she knows whereof she speaks when she gives these kinds of descriptions. Oh, there's nothing wrong with you, my dear. You know, just brushing it all off. Take a bromide, okay, uh, and, uh, and buck up. Take courage. Well, and, and fortunately, and she always credited him for this and with this, her husband, Virginia's husband, Leonard, uh, was apparently enormously helpful to her in getting through those periods. So, well, of course, Septimus's reaction to this is he was deserted. The whole world was clamoring. Kill yourself, kill yourself for our sakes. But why should he kill himself for their sakes? And so forth. Well, Okay, uh, Risi is gone for a moment and he hears a voice from behind a screen in the room and it was Evan speaking. The dead were with him. And more and more he's talking about committing suicide and more and more we're going to have uh, this, this horrible, horrible business of his having fantasies about committing suicide. Uh, he goes to see the most famous psychiatrist in London, who is Sir William Bradshaw. And Bradshaw says, proportion, 
keep everything in proportion, keep everything in balance. The problem with these people is they let things get out of proportion. So when they do, we have to restore their proportion, their sense of proportion. So, uh, proportion, divine proportion. Sir William's goddess was acquired by Sir William, walking hospitals, catching salmon, begetting one son in Harley Street by Lady Bradshaw, who caught salmon herself and took photographs, scarcely to be distinguished from the work of professionals. Worshipping proportion, Sir William not only prospered himself, but made England prosper, secluded her lunatics, forbade childbirth, penalized despair, made it impossible for the unfit to propagate their views <coughs> until they too shared his sense of proportion. His, if they were men, Lady Bradshaw's, if they were women. She embroidered, knitted, spent four nights out of seven at home with her son. See, this is all proper proportion. So that not only did his colleagues respect him, his subordinates feared him but the friends and relations of his patients felt for him the keenest gratitude for insisting that these prophetic Christs and Christuses who prophesied the end of the world or the advent of God should drink milk in bed as Sir William ordered. Sir William, with his 30 years experience of these kinds of cases and his infallible instinct, this is madness this sense, in fact, his sense of proportion. Well, okay. And then he talks also about conversion. Another one of his, uh, of his notions. Well, okay. So then we cut to the, uh, the lunch with Lady Bruton, Hugh Whitbread, uh, Richard Dalloway, the concocting the letter to the Times. And here are these ineffectual people of the upper classes, you know, drafting their letter to the Times as if that's going to change the world. Uh, this is, of course, the London Times that, that we're talking about here. Then we have an interesting section uh, with Elizabeth Dalloway and Miss Kilman. Miss Kilman is a woman who has undergone a religious conversion. And she's very dedicated not only to her religion, but also to her causes for the people and for helping poor people. And all of that is very admirable, except that she has nothing but scorn for anybody who won't make those kinds of commitments. And so Miss Kilman, by the way, among other people, very, very, very much not only resents, but is scornful of Mrs. Dalloway and keeps telling Elizabeth, whom she is luring away from the Dalloways and making a kind of protege of her own. Doesn't finally work, but for a while it appears to work. And Clarissa Dalloway is concerned that her daughter Elizabeth is falling too much, she believes, under the influence of Miss Kilman. Uh, and Miss Kilman, of course, is also a feminist, and she keeps insisting that while she is an educated woman and she has been able to make certain kinds of reasonable choices for herself, she did not have the same opportunities that are now opening up for women of Elizabeth's age. You can be anything, she says. And of course, there was a certain element of truth to that. I mean, it was not true, of course, that a woman could do or be anything in the 1920s. But there was that tremendous sense of excitement and of opening up of a whole new world of opportunities. And of course, that's a process that continues. And so, by the way, if anybody were to take 
the uh, the woman question, what the Victorians called the woman question, and apply it to this novel. Some of these things are precisely the points that one would get into. You know, not only Clarissa Dalloway and the whole question of what is she doing with her life? What is she really doing with her life? Uh, she wonders about that from time to time. Peter Walsh thinks that to a large extent she's really throwing away her life and, and not taking advantage of the opportunities that she could have. Um, what about Miss Kilman? What about Elizabeth? What about the relationship between the two of them? What about Sally? What about Sally is the young rebel when she's a teenager on vacation with the others compared to what she becomes by the end of the novel when she appears suddenly and unexpectedly and of course without an invitation really but knowing that she would have been invited at Clarissa Dalloway's party, okay? And she's transformed in certain respects. So what are we talking about in terms of women, gender roles, and so forth? The same kind of thing comes up over and over again, as you might well expect in Virginia Woolf's novels. She was not only a very ardent feminist herself, but also, remember a room of one's own and the kinds of arguments there? Well, she not only lived out those arguments in her own life and career, but she wrote a lot about women. She wrote about men, too. And that also raises the interesting question from a room of one's own, where she had said that the true genius, literary genius at any rate, should be androgynous, should be able to imagine, if she's a woman, what it would be like to be a man, to experience, to feel like a man. Or if the author is a man, to move in the other direction, be able to experience, to be able to feel what a woman might feel. Well, okay, notice that her male characters are a really very interesting and very successful characters. I mean, in an artistic sense, very successfully done. Okay, so we have all of that, which is, which is very, very, very interesting. Um, <clears throat> then we have Bradshaw deciding as the great psychiatrist, and of course the great authority, he's even been knighted because he's such a great authority. Uh, deciding that Septimus needs to be taken away. And this is going to be to a nice place out in the country where he will be well taken care of and given the right kind of therapy. Septimus, of course, doesn't know about this, certainly not yet. Rizia now knows about it. They actually have some nice moments together and he's beginning to learn about you know, what they're planning for him. But they actually have some nice moments together. And they even laugh together and share some intimacy together in the way that a husband and a wife could share together. But then Dr. Holmes comes in his own bumbling way and unfeeling way to get Septimus and to take him off to a kind of sanitarium. And so what do we have? We have Septimus realizing that they're, that, that they're coming for him um, and Holmes was coming. Razors he might have got, but Razia, who always did that sort of thing, had packed them so he couldn't cut his wrists with a razor. There remained only the window, the large Bloomsbury lodging house window, tiresome, troublesome, rather melodramatic business of opening the window and throwing himself out, which, of course, is what he does, and he throws himself down so that he is impaled on the spikes of the fence. And, of course, that's how he dies. And as Dr. Holmes breaks into the room, 
the one who advocated golfing as therapy, he cries out, the coward, as if that's the, whole, the only thing he can think of. The coward. He's killed himself. Therefore, he just must be a coward. Well, okay, notice that the doctors are not only unfeeling, but they're totally ineffectual in the novel, possibly reflecting the experience of Wolf herself. Well, then we get to the party. She is worried about whether or not her party is going to be successful. Peter shows up. She's glad of that, but she doesn't really know what he's thinking. Sally shows up. She's delighted by that. And then people are coming. All of the lords and ladies, all of the important people are coming to her party, to her party. Even the prime minister comes to her party, though uh, you know, it seems that he's really quite an ordinary person in most respects. But he is nevertheless the prime minister, and that's very important to her. Then Bradshaw comes in, and Bradshaw brings up the, the fact that this suicide has taken place. And of course, it's Septimus having committed suicide. And her reaction is simply, why does he want to spoil my party? Spoil my party by talking about suicide. Some poor young guy committing suicide. So notice how egotistical, or as we nowadays say, how egocentric this is. And then, of course, we come to the end of the party and Peter, and how beautiful all of this really has been. But once again, the whole point of the narrative has been to develop not only her and her party, but everybody in relation to one another as related through the party. Okay. <clears throat>